In case you couldn't tell, I've definitely been traveling a lot on my trip, and it can be a little bit challenging to pack around with you everything you need to make tech videos or EV videos on YouTube, and still pack around all of your clothes, your toiletries, you know, your essentials, and, and on top of the, all of that, we haven't checked any luggage. I've basically been living out of a backpack for the past three weeks, and I'm not even close to ready to go home yet. We still have more adventures, more places to visit along the way, but it's got me thinking a lot of what would happen if I lost all of my tech. I don't know, I got robbed, or I had my backpack with me on a ferry, and the ferry sank, or the airline somehow took my backpack and lost it. So in the back of my head, I've been thinking, like, what would my backup plan be in the event that I lost all of my tech? And I thought that might be a fun video to hypothesize, just in case it does happen, and it might be a fun exercise for you guys, too. Let's begin. So if I haven't mentioned it before, I'm still very happy with my current tech ecosystem. I love my MacBook Pro, I love my watch and my phone, but I think I have certain tech products that kind of fall into my life because I bought them or they were available at a certain time for a certain price, and things have definitely changed. And I think that makes me comfortable in saying if I did lose my MacBook Pro, which I love, and I would be very, very heartbroken, especially if all the footage and files that are on it were suddenly lost, but I don't think I would replace it with the exact same model. First of all, I always wanted silver from the beginning. It was a mistake that I got Space Gray. I was just so excited when they first came out. I pre-ordered it very quickly. And then Apple also gave me a 6% cash back on accident through the Apple card. And they said I wouldn't get that if I ordered the MacBook again. So I was basically financially incentivized to keep that original MacBook I bought. But if I was buying one again, I think for one, I would definitely go either certified refurbished or Amazon renewed. And no, I would not go for the M2 Pro or the M2 to max. I don't find those chips substantially faster than the M1 Pro or M1 Max, so I would likely end up sticking with an M1 Pro MacBook just because I've seen a lot of export tests and I don't think that the M1 Max is substantially faster than the M1 Pro when it comes to Final Cut export times, which matters to me because I edit so many videos. But I went with the non-binned M1 Max on my current MacBook. I think if I had to replace it, I would be more motivated to see how cheap I could get it. So I would probably go with a binned M1 Pro. I'd be like, okay, I've seen the fastest the M1 can get. Let's see, like, on the lower end of the Pro level chips, how decent is a binned M1 Pro? I've heard a lot of you guys who have picked up those M1 Pro MacBooks say that even the binned version is still really fast and really capable. So I would get a silver MacBook, still probably 16 inches, because I appreciate having that extra screen real estate, and I still honestly find my 16 inch MacBook Pro a little bit small. I know a lot of people may find me crazy in that way, but I just got so accustomed to editing everything on a 27 inch iMac. Now having to downscale all that to a 16 inch display still feels a little tricky for me. So no, I wouldn't compromise and go with a 14 inch MacBook Pro for likely I could find one for 1400 or 1500. But even through Apple, I've been able to find some 16 inch MacBook Pros with mini LED and with ProMotion and everything that start below $2,000. So yeah, I wouldn't prioritize the storage if I had to buy one again just because I would likely be motivated to keep the price as low as possible and I do have an external SSD that I could tap into in an emergency. Obviously having all of that storage local is a lot easier and more convenient but if I had to buy the whole thing over again I don't think I would blow all that money a second time. So I would go the cheaper route for sure on take two and just essentially find the base model 16 inch silver I could get. I could make do with 512 gigs of storage and 16 gigs of RAM. It's not ideal but I think I could live with it. And then on top of that, another lifesaver during this entire trip has been my AirPods Pro. So many noisy environments on boats and ferries and airplanes where that active noise cancellation has really paid off. And I've been rocking technically kind of the same pair of AirPods Pro since 2019, except because they've had defects, Apple has technically replaced every single component of it, but I didn't have to pay for that. Though I will admit if I did misplace them or if I did lose them on this trip, I probably would not buy first generation AirPods Pro. It's the one Apple product that I've bought and reviewed and then returned and ended up regretting, which is the second generation AirPods Pro. Now you can find them for sub $200 on Amazon. And yes, the noise cancellation is better. Yes, the sound quality is better. But the main reason I still kind of want AirPods Pro second gen is something I literally ran into just last night. The fact that you can charge it with the Apple Watch charge puck. I keep running into situations where, you know, I'm using all my tech all day 
away and sometimes we're traveling later than expected and that means I'm away from a charger so charging up all my devices like my watch my phone and my airpods all at once starts to feel a little bit more common than when I do at home and there's been times where I'm like okay I don't need to charge my watch but I do need to charge my phone and I would like to charge my airpods but I can't because MagSafe Duo only charges one device via Qi and the other device has to be the watch but I remember back reviewing airpods pro 2 how I could just dock it on the side and it would make that satisfying little charging sound and while it's hard to justify spending the whole $200 right now because my first generation airpods pro they do work and I'm satisfied with them like they get the job done but there's just these little edge cases where I'm like mm, airpods pro 2 you could help me right now especially with the volume adjustment on the airpod itself like when I'm using my android phone the doji I can't control the volume off of that thing through my apple watch so if there was a way to adjust the volume from the airpod itself yeah these little use cases pop up from time to time and trust me i've been very tempted to buy it but i just out of principle want to continue using my airpods pro one until they stop working or are completely done for because i've gotten so many of the components replaced over time and no i don't want to sell them because there's so much earwax in them and i've tried to let my wife use them she doesn't really like the fit as much as airpods 2 for her ears so yeah airpods pro 2 would be on my list if airpods pro 1 went bad but until they went bad and until they become unusable i'm still gonna keep using them and then that brings us to the watch itself this has been useful for keeping track of time zones and i've been loving my series 7 ever since 2021 when i picked it up and unlike the first two products i talked about i wouldn't upgrade this you know nothing about the series 8 is tempting to me i think all of the advantages of the series 8 are for women unfortunately not for me and i tried the apple watch ultra you know it's cool and everything but as much as i'd appreciate that longer battery life i still can't quite get comfortable with the design i'm happy for you for the record if you like the apple watch ultra design that's great for you i want everybody to feel like there's a product for them that fits their needs best and it's kind of shocking it's kind of surprising how often i see apple watch ultras both on youtube and in public a lot of people suddenly can justify dropping 800 bucks on a watch which is hilarious to me because just a few years ago i can remember everyone saying apple was crazy for expecting people to pay $350 for an Apple Watch, but it's interesting how they kind of normalize the higher pricing for certain tech products, right? Maybe another tech product they might start to normalize higher pricing for, but that's for another day. So nothing about the Apple Watch Series 9 that's been rumored is that impressive to me, so I think if I lost my Series 7, I would probably replace it with almost the exact same spec. I've seen 45 millimeter Series 7s on Amazon going for like low $400, maybe less now, and you can find those for a really, really good deal and it's renewed and in excellent condition and you get a 90 day return window if you don't like it. Still comes with a watch band and everything. So I'm still very happy with my Apple Watch Series 7. And yes, I want the stainless steel version, not for the stainless steel though, just that sapphire glass, which has paid off on this trip. Tons of swimming environments where I'm scraping my Apple Watch against hard rock or cement. And if I was wearing an aluminum Apple Watch, I'd be paranoid about how many scratches I was giving it. But this sapphire glass is downright almost indestructible when it comes to scratches and scrapes. Still looks pristine. I'm very, very happy with the durability of it. And the battery life is decent enough for me the majority of the time. So partly because of price, you know, I already felt like I was stretching a bit to drop the $800 on this watch that I dropped. So if I was buying an Apple Watch again, I wouldn't want to go for the Ultra, partly because of the looks, but also because the price is going to be a lot higher than uh, Amazon renewed Series 7 in steel. That's just gonna give me exactly what I already have and I'm happy with it and the durability of it is great. Also in regards to the chargers, I know some of you are probably already suggesting, well you should buy this 3-in-1 charger so you can charge all three things at the same time, but truthfully I still prefer my MagSafe Duo because of how easy it is to pack up and throw in a bag. It's very convenient, it's very lightweight, doesn't take up a lot of space and when you're not checking luggage, partly because we don't trust the airlines to manage the luggage properly as Randy has talked about on the tech podcast and also because the flights we found were a lot cheaper if you didn't have to check luggage like we're in a crazy world right now where actually paying for the luggage to be shipped on the plane starts to cost more than shipping yourself like it's really really expensive for check luggage plus it slows things down when you've got short layovers and you're running through the airport through immigration and through security and everything not having to worry about your checked luggage is kind of refreshing so I'm all about traveling light and our backpacks are like stuffed to the brim almost zero additional space when I'm trying to pack 
my microphone, my MacBook, our passports, our clothes, everything we need. So every square inch counts. And that's why I'm happy to pack around a two-in-one charger that is very thin and compact. I can even throw it in my pocket when I need to. And sometimes on these trips, we take kind of spontaneous day trips to other locations that I wasn't expecting. And just having a quick little charger that I can unplug and fold up has been really, really useful. The only issue with MagSafe Duo is it's lightning. Hopefully we get a USB-C version later this year. But yeah, I'm not interested in any larger or any bulkier three-in-one chargers that you guys might recommend. I'm happy with MagSafe Duo for the most part. In my opinion, it's an AirPods issue, not a charger issue. But this brings us to the last piece of the puzzle, of course, the iPhone. I've been using the SE2 for a while now and recording this video on it as we speak. And I got to admit, I've been very happy with it. It's still running iOS 17 beta 2. Yes, the battery life sucks, but I've got chargers, especially thanks to my 16-inch MacBook Pro. It's basically just a ginormous battery bank that I can tap into at any time on the go. And I thought a lot about this one, you know, would I consider getting a 12 mini or a 13 mini if I did lose my SE2? And honestly, it's really, really refreshing to know that I can get by and be comfortable for work and for vlogging and for taking pictures on these trips with an iPhone that you can buy for like a hundred bucks on eBay refurbished. This is a really, really cheap iPhone with great specs. And while yes, I don't love the home button, I still kind of miss gesture control. And yes, the display is not all that great. As far as a tool goes, like using a phone for work, checking email, checking the news through Twitter, recording videos, both for tech channels and for lifestyle channels like Talos of Life, the SE2 has been getting the job done, surprisingly, even with its 78% battery health. Yes, the battery drains very quickly, but that's where the douchey phone kind of makes up for the shortcomings. It becomes my really, really long battery life device for media consumption on those long flights or long boat rides. And the iPhone SE2 is my designated camera because of how great the video quality is. And even the onboard audio quality is not that bad for quick little vlogging shots that you can catch up on on Talos of Life. So as bizarre as it may sound to a lot of you, yes, if I lost my SE2 today, I would probably just buy another iPhone SE2. You can find them for so cheap and you know they're going to keep getting software updates for at least another two years. And for a hundred bucks, you can't complain. I can't describe the free feeling you get when you're used to having a phone that is a thousand dollars and you're worried about it dropping or breaking compared to having a phone that's like one hundred dollars and it's like I could drop this or break this and no big issue. You know, I can replace it for probably less money than what it costs you to get Apple Care with your iPhone 14 Pro. So the only change maybe is I might opt for a higher storage option. Only 64 gigs on this phone is a little bit constricting and I might opt for the red option because red is my favorite color. So I would like a red SE2 and I found those for pretty cheap as well. But other than that, that pretty much completes my tech ecosystem. If I had to replace it today, what would you guys do differently with your current existing ecosystem? Feel free to let me know down in the comments below. And thank you to everybody supporting this channel directly. It seriously helps us out a ton as does just watching these videos. This is your Apple Sheep here and I will see you all in the next one.